Hello everyone, welcome to Rail Signaling Academy. Now this one's going to be a short video where I explain what tractive effort curves are, why do they look like the way they do, and then also where they are used. Now if you are a signaling or a rolling stock engineer, then you would have come across tractive effort curves at various points in your life. For a signaling engineer, which is where I come from, these tractive effort curves are used basically for the headway calculation and for save braking model. For headway calculation, we need to know how much a train can accelerate. And what this graph tells me is that the train acceleration is not uniform and that as the speed increases, the acceleration starts to drop. Similarly, for safe braking model, we need to know how much a train can accelerate deliberately or accidentally. And this graph tells me that the acceleration is different at different speeds. Now, one thing you would have noticed is that all of these graphs seem to have a similar shape, is that they're flat in the beginning and then they start to drop off. And in this video, I'll be explaining why the shape is like this. Let's look at first part of the shape. Now, the concept here that I'm talking about is all the engines are power limited, which means that there's a maximum limit of work that they can do in unit time. If you were to use some physics formula, what you will see is that peak power equals force time velocity. And if this peak power is constant, then the graph of force times velocity will look something like this. But there's a fundamental problem with this graph. One problem is that the graph seems to suggest that there's infinite tractive effort at low velocity and that you can actually have infinite velocity, but that's not true. There are physical limits to both of these components, velocity and tractive effort. The first one is adhesion limit. If you look at this diagram here, this yellow is the point of contact between the wheel and rail. What you'll see is that the frictional force between the wheel and the rail is equal to mu times F, where F is the maximum vertical force applied, which is also weight of the train. And this is basically the maximum forward force a wheel can apply on the rail. Reason being, at any moment, the force exceeds this value, then you overcome the frictional force and your wheel will start slipping, something like this here. So basically this limit becomes your adhesion limit and that becomes the maximum tractive effort that you can apply on the wheel. Some systems can actually limit the tractive effort a little bit lower just to leave some margin. Now the other limit is the velocity limit and there's different types of engines that are used in railways, but I'm only going to talk about the two main ones. Now, the first one is AC motor, and that motor has a maximum RPM that it can run at. That max RPM is limited by these factors. There's motor heating limitations. At high RPM, there's high centrifugal force. The motor can literally fall apart. Then there's insulation breakdown, which is all the electrical components. Similarly, if you look at diesel engines, so on diesel engines, you can see that there are these two valves. They have an open close time. It cannot be more than a certain limit. That's just how valves are designed. Similarly, you need to give enough time for the fuel to burn. So beyond a certain certain RPM, you're not giving enough time to burn the fuel. And then there's fatigue limits of all these mechanical components. Then there are things which are common to both, such as there's mechanical transmission systems that connect the engine to the wheel. Those systems have their fatigue limits. Then there's bearing limits, vibration limits. There's many, many things that restrict the maximum RPM. And that's what's going to restrict the maximum velocity. So this will decide the velocity limit of the tractive effort curve. If I were to summarize, then the tractive effort curve produced by the engine looks something like this. But that curve is produced by the engine. But when you start running the train in real, then the tractive effort curve, which is the actual tractive effort curve, looks a little bit different. Now let's talk about resistance. Now this is the resistance that your train will experience when it's on the track and is very aptly characterized by Davis equation. And this Davis equation has three components. The first component is independent of velocity. If you look at the factors under that component, then it's rolling resistance, track resistance, general resistance. Then there's a second component, and this component increases with velocity. If you look at the factors, it's flange friction, flange impact, and other factors. If you think about it intuitively, the faster your train is running, the more flange impact your train is going to have. And if you look at the third component, component, this component increases with velocity square. And because of that, this component becomes extremely high for high speed trains. The factors are rear drag, turbulence between the cars. Basically, all of these factors are aerodynamic related. That's why for high speed trains, aerodynamics become very critical. 
Now here I'm going to take a little tangent and talk about aerodynamic resistance and the strategies. Uh, if you look at the first one, well the nose is very clearly aerodynamically designed. Then if you can see the doors are flushed, then there's intercar gap. There's gap between two cars, but this gap has been filled such as there is no turbulence at this point. Even the windows are flushed. And if you look at the train base, the train base is covered and it's not left uncovered for the drag that the train would experience under car. Then the next running resistance that your train experiences is gradient. Very simply put, if your train is going on an up gradient and the angle is this, then force that your train experiences is this. And if you look at the graph, these straight lines depict the resistance due to gradient. Now, what I'm going to do is add running resistance and this gradient resistance and subtract that from the previous curve. So let's summarize what we saw in this presentation. The first thing we saw was power limited section. Then the second thing we saw was that this power limited section was limited due to adhesion. Then we also saw that there were limits due to engine design. And this curve basically becomes the curve that is available from the engine. But that's not the actual curve that you get. For that, you need to subtract running resistance. Then we looked at the running resistance. Now, if you were to subtract the tractive effort available by the engine minus the running resistance, then the curve that you get finally, the one that is actually available to the train, looks something like this blue curve. Now, I hope I was able to cover the basics of tractive effort curve, and I hope this video was informative for you. That's it for today. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.